So in today's message, today's title is Abide, and what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the word grounded. So who knows what grounded means? Ground, Brian? Yes, yes, Hannah. But yes, but not that. Hannah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. So we'll throw up some definitions up there. One of them is from the Cambridge Dictionary. Someone who is grounded makes good decisions and does not say or do stupid things. Pretty straightforward. We'll look at another definition from the Collins Dictionary. And it says, uh, grounded meaning, if you say that someone is grounded, you mean that they are sensible and reasonable, and they understand the importance of ordinary things in life. And that's the British language. Yes. Electrified? I don't know. <laughs> if you look it up in the thesaurus, or antonym, find the antonym of... Uh, find the antonym of grounded. I'm trying to think. It's like, I know it's there. It's just my mind's just not. That's why I have notes. Praise God. So the next one is going to be an English or the American language type of grounded. And it means firmly established. So kind of like you were saying about how like well-rounded. Practical or realistic. Natural, sincere, stable, and secure. And so when we talk about being grounded in Jesus, so think about it now. So if those, it means those things. We'll keep that last definition up there really quick. So when you're grounded in the biblical aspect or uh, in, the, in the Christian sense of grounded, you are grounded in who? One, you can be grounded in your identity in Christ. You can be grounded, meaning that you have the mind of Christ, so you're sensible you know what to say, you hold your peace, you realize that in the end, Jesus wins, you don't have to freak out about events in life that are going on. When you're grounded, you're sincere, you're stable. See, when you're grounded, you can hear clearly. Now, when you look at electrical cords, there's a who's, who knows what the outlet looks like. It has two prongs, and it has a little circular prong at the bottom. That is called the ground. And what that does is that if anything were to go wrong, I think where anything would go wrong, it helps um, uh, in music, like music term, when you ground something, it helps uh, eliminate the noise or the fuzz. And that's actually well soldered. Grounding, what, what does electrical grounding do? Okay, actually, we're going to move away from that because I need to <laughs> brush up on my electrical skills because I'm a carpenter, not an electrician. So, being grounded. Being grounded. Being grounded in Christ. Being secure, being reasonable. When you're grounded in Christ, you have common sense. Or you should have common sense. When you're grounded in Christ, you are secure in your identity. When you are grounded in Christ, you're not worried about the future or what your future holds because you know the one Holds the future. So the passage we're going to be looking through is John chapter 15, 1 through 4. We may go a little further than that. So in order to stay grounded, I'll say this, in order to stay grounded, you need to abide. Well, that's really hard to see. And so here's what the first verse says. We're going to get straight into it. We're going to set the scene. So here's what the verse says. I am the true darkness. Okay, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Can we turn the house lights down a little bit, just so it's, or maybe we can, no, we can't do that. Just so it's not so, well, not those lights. I meant the other ones, the other house lights. The, yeah, that's the one. Thanks for reading my mind. <laughs> so every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Say abide. Say abide. 
We're going to set the scene now. Jesus is having this teaching moment in the midst of Passover. So this is right before Jesus, or not right before, but this is the events leading up to his um, betrayal, taken away by the guards, going to go to the cross, and he's giving them these words. So uh, Judas just left, so he's not there. Jesus said, go ahead and go ahead and do what you need to do. And then he was with his disciples. And I think it's important to realize that if these are some of Jesus's final words before his death and resurrection, um, we should be paying attention and take note of what he's saying. And then why is it important to understand what's going on? Because context is important. Because if I, if someone, if I'm, so think of it this way. Have you ever walked in on a conversation and only heard one word and thought, that person was insane? For instance, you come into a room and all of a sudden you see someone with a knife to the person like this, and then you, all, you, all you hear and see is you're going to die. You think, like, oh my gosh, this person's going to kill somebody. But what you didn't realize is that he said you're going to die. He was saying, like, hey, if you play with this knife and if you do dumb things and you're practicing all this stuff and you accidentally impale yourself, you're going to die. Yeah. So now when you put it into context, you know that the person, you, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not threatening Nick to kill him. <laughs> I'm saying, hey, there's some dangerous stuff you need to be aware of. And if you do this, you could die. So context, context is important. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break it down. Why, so we see Jesus talk about, um, we'll go verse 1, uh, 15 verse 1. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Why did Jesus use, actually Jesus was very smart, and he used the example of a vineyard. Why would he use the example of a vineyard? I think outside the box a little bit. Why would he, why would he use the example of a vineyard when he's talking to these guys? Tough? Mm -hmm. That's good. It answers a little bit more simple, though. Even though that is a good answer. It is a very good answer. Because culturally, they all knew what a vineyard was. That was their lifestyle. That was, they grew up seeing the farming. They grew up seeing all these vineyards. It was talked about. There was... Um, and that was just natural part of life. And so when you're, so think about it this way too, when you're ministering to someone, oh, ministering, when you're sharing the Bible with someone and you're trying to communicate a truth of the Bible to someone that you know, one of the best things that you can do is communicate the Bible in the, concept, in the context of the culture. In the context of the culture. So you can still, without taking away the truth of the word, it is possible to do, but you got to know your word. You got to know your word. It could be like this. Um, everyone knows what. I'll just give an example. It's not like a great example. I'll just give an example. So, for instance, uh, God. For instance, God is like the school, and Jesus is like the school bus. Come on, some of my next gens didn't we? We did. Uh, you guys did this with some objects, right? You found something, be like, hey, this is X, Y, Z. Um, actually, who remembers, their, who remembers their presentation? Like, really well, through and through. Through and through, no? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all good. So imagine it this way. So I'm going to say, like, oh, man, you know, God's like, you know, God has all the information. He has all the knowledge you need. It was like, well, you know, how in the world, how in the world do I get to know God? It's like, well, you know, you got to go through Jesus. Jesus is like the school bus, man. And he's like, like a school bus? What do you mean he's like a school bus? He's like, yeah, he's like the school bus. God is like the school. He's like the guy that teaches you and gives you the knowledge you need. And Jesus is like the school bus. And so what you need to do is you need to be ready because the school bus is coming by you, which is Jesus. He's coming up and bringing opportunities. And what you got to do is you got to hop on that school bus because that school bus is going to school. And so for order for you to get to know God, you need to get with Jesus. And he takes you to God. Does that make sense? Just as when you know the word, and mind you, it's not the greatest example, but it's an example. When you know the word, learn how to communicate the message of the gospel through your culture. And there's many ways. And 
that was just, that was the Lord. Because <laughs> my mind likes to go everywhere in which way. But you are able to do it. Listen, you have access. You don't know what you don't know until you don't know that you don't, that you have it. What I mean is that you, you grow and learn in stages when you realize you feel like you know a lot. How many were in middle school? All of us. Well, at some point. You're in middle school, okay, in school at a young point, and you thought, man, I know everything. I'm friends with everybody. I know all the signs. I know all the whatever. And then you get to high school, and then you realize how many felt the realization like, wow, I really don't know anything. Yes, no. And then you get, you graduate from high school, and then say you go to college, and you're like, wow, I really don't thought I knew stuff, but I, I really don't know as much as I thought. And then you get out of college, and you get into the, the work social life, and you think to yourself, wow, I really had no idea what I was getting into. So you don't know what you don't know until you don't know. Until you know. That's correct. So Jesus used a vineyard as an example because he knew it was a way that they would understand who God was and what and the message and the message that he was trying to teach them. And here's the message that he was teaching them. And that he gave two examples. So he says, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Or um Another word for vine dresser is just the, the hus, uh, husband, husbandman, the guy who, pretty much the farmer who takes care of all the vineyards, make sure everything's good to go. So go to the next verse, verse 2. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So we see that he gives two examples, the branch that doesn't bear fruit and the branch that does bear fruit. I want just to look at this really interesting. It's like when we're reading the Bible, it is very important to understand. I know that sounds like that sounds redundant, but it's very important to understand what we're reading. So you need to do some digging. And the word, oh, 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 it's okay. Let's look at my notes. Um, <clears throat> so here's what it says, that a branch that does not bear fruit, oh, oh, he takes away. Now, when we look at the word takes away, there's, a, there's an important, so the translation isn't wrong, it's just translated different. And Bible scholars, Bible scholars have been studying this word takes away, and then the word takes away is more accurately translated lifts up. Because you see, you go on to the further passages, and it says that every branch that is dead, he throws away. So it's kind of interesting how, like, he wouldn't, the way that he's wording is that he wouldn't say throw away, take away, and then throw away. He says the, hus the, the, hus what the husband or the vine dresser does that he lifts up. Agriculturally, that makes more sense. Because the lift up comes from the Greek word airo. And it means, rather than to take away, it means to lift up. Because when we read it, we think like, man, he's like, he's just, he's just tossing it out. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. He's connected to the vine. It's not bearing fruit. He just takes it away. Oh, and see, here's what can happen is that as we read that, we can think, man, okay, if I'm not doing stuff for God, he's just going to cut me off, which is wrong. He's not going to cut you off. Why? Because we look at the scriptures and we see that salvation, our salvation isn't based off of works. It's based off of our confession. Because it's nothing that we do, physically do, that earns our salvation because we can't earn it. Our salvation is a gift. And so when we read it this way, how it says that he lifts up. So now look at this again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. And why does he lift it up? He lifts it up so that he can put it in a position to where it can bear fruit. And when you read it and realize it through that way, it's like, okay, God's not out to get me if I'm not doing stuff for men, but he wants to bring me to a place 
where I am bearing fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Bella? Yes? Very good. Easy. Fruit. He lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And some of us in our walk, as we, so here's, so here's kind of the progression, is that as we, um, when we give our lives to Jesus, and we begin to walk out our salvation, sometimes we can get lost and caught up in the things that we used to do. And so here's what happens is that we realize, okay, we've, we've made that choice to come to Jesus because we know we can't do it on our own. We can't live a good life. We can't X, Y, Z. So what does Jesus, so what does God do? Sometimes he removes things, barriers, lifts us up and out of our lives, and, and from situations that aren't doing us any good. Because if that branch remains on the ground, you can get bugs, you can get disease, it'll wither and die. And the last thing that God wants for you is to wither and watch you fail. He wants to see you thrive and succeed. And so if you're struggling or having a hard time, you can cry out to God, hey, Lord, I need some help. And he's like, okay, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to lift you up. And what does the vine dresser do? It's cool because when they begin to trim all or prune the vineyard, there's pruning for fruit bearing, and then there's pruning for bearing more fruit. So if you're not in a place where you are bearing fruit or you're not seeing it, you can ask God, say, hey, I need some help because I'm not seeing seeing the fruit. I'm not seeing the, the life and the, the change, and he's going to be like, okay, I'm going to bring you to a place where you're gonna, I'm going to cut some things out of your life. I'm going to bring some conviction, which is a good thing. Don't ever run away from it. Run to it. And you're beginning to know. You're going to begin to sense, like, okay, God, and, and you be honest. God, what do I need? What do I need to do? Hey, you need to stop hanging around with these friends. Hey, you need to stop listening to this music because it's giving you a bad influence. And see, music is one of those tricky things because you can listen to music and be like, oh, I just love the beat. It sounds so good. And hey, I, I love music. I love listening to all types of music, rock, metal, indie, whatever it is, um, K-pop. Um, <laughs> I, okay, I know that's not right. But K-pop is cool. I like it. But again, you need to be careful what you're listening to. Music is one of the most powerful influences, hence why you see, you can see a heavily demonic influence in the music industry because the devil knows. I mean, shoot, devil was the head honcho for all, for all music. And so he knows how to get to people. He knows what beats you like, what lyrics. And you know what? He'll, he'll masquerade the song, and then he'll start speaking words. Listen, words are powerful. And if you don't believe in the power of words, you, you should. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And because those words are being spoken and they're being put into your mind and that thoughts go into your heart and that's what you begin to mull over. And so here, bringing it back to this, so if that's the point where you're listening and you're breathing and you're being a part of something, you're resting in it, what you need to do is flip that, whether it's cell phone, social media, whatever, and you need to, to flip that to be like, okay, I just need to do this habit but in a godly way. Instead of secular music, I'm going to start listening to worship music. Instead of uh, doom scrolling on my phone, I want to read the Bible app. Instead of, or I'm going to set a limit. Or if it's, you know what, these, I can hang out with these friends, but when it gets past a certain point, it's like, okay, you know what, now I got to go. You ask God, he gives you the conviction, and then you follow and act in it. So here's what happens is that He lifts up. God's not out to get you. He wants you to bear fruit. He wants you to bear life. 
And every branch, and this is cool, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it can bear more. And as you're bearing fruit, it's the result of a proper environment, temperature, sun. And I really want to hit, hit the nail on the head with this, is that, um, who knows John 3.16? Okay, who knows verse 17? Okay, we're gonna look at we're gonna look at this, John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And here's the part that most people don't read and should read, which is verse 17. After this, for God did not send his son in the world, into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Listen, I want to tell you one thing: the Bible never contradicts itself. So if you ever find yourself in a place of confusion or contradiction, you pray. Lord, make sense of this. Or you go to someone, a leader. Um, I would recommend another, a cool guy you can go to is RJ. That's one guy I know who studies the word, always reading, always trying to understand, always trying to know the depths of God. Hunger, get a hunger. Because what we can do sometimes is like, this doesn't make sense, and... Oh, I'm too late, or I'm, I'm too tired, or oh, it takes so much effort to try and figure out what this means. And then we stop. I'll be honest. I, I mean, I stop sometimes. Like, man, I gotta, there's so much I got to do. There's so much I have to understand. There's so much I got to try and read and figure out. But if you take the time and read to figure out, look at this life is so temporal. This life is so temporal. And you can be plugged in, and you can abide in worldly things. And worldly things don't have to be bad they can be food, they can be media, they can be activities in life, they can be friends. Whatever it is that isn't God, I tell you what, it's going to eventually burn out. But you abide and get plugged into the source, which is God. You will never, you will have, you'll be like the Energizer Bunny. Just keeps going and going and going and going. He lifts up. And we're going to look at the Greek word for abide really quick. The Greek word for abide is meno or mena. Mena. I have have an app and it shows me what the Greek word is. And I say, Strong's G, blah, blah, blah. Mena. Mena. And it means to be kept and to remain. An example that it gives is hilarious is that an example it gives is of a dead body. Okay, if a body, can a dead body move? Can it speak? Does it have feelings? Does it stay in one spot? Will it ever move? It is abiding in that one spot for the rest of its life. Never moving, never talking, not going anywhere. This is the example it gives of abiding in Christ. When it says to abide in Christ, it's like when you abide in Christ, you abide like a dead body. (laughs) That means you don't move, you don't run. Have you ever, and here, I guess, <laughs> I just thought it was so interesting. It's like, man, it's like, well, a dead body can't do nothing. And if it's meaning abide in the sense of that, you're just like, you know, like a dead body, you're going to sit and it's going to move. It, it literally stays in one spot. Oh, well, yeah, that's, there is, there's, there's that. But besides that, we're talking about in a perfect world in the middle of nowhere. It's not going to go anywhere. Well, I guess there's earthquakes and centers. Anyway, so so here's here's what I want to here's what I want to stress. Here's what I want to see. We see, and this is something I want you guys to write down if you're taking notes. Is that we see Jesus stress on abiding, not producing. Producing is a byproduct of abiding. Have you ever seen a branch 
that's connected to a fruit tree struggle to try and produce fruit. I mean, have you ever, yeah, seriously, have you ever seen a brand struggle to grow fruit? No. Have you ever seen an apple tree struggle to bear apples? Have you ever seen, Brian? Okay, well, we'll save that long story for later. <laughs> that sounds like a really long story, so love you, Brian. Um, you don't ever see branches struggling to produce fruit. All you see is the fruit coming out because the branch is connected to the tree. God, the vine dresser, wants to bring you into a place where you can grow and become healthy and strong in Jesus. He lifts you up and clears the way for you to get the proper nutrients you need to thrive. There was a really good quote. There was uh, many people who have, before me, who have studied this. And some of us don't like being prim because, listen, when you're in a place where it's good and you're like, man, I'm on fire for Jesus and, like, I'm going to church every Sunday and Wednesday and, like, I'm reading my Bible. Like, this is good. You feel like, man, this is great. And God's like, sweet, I'm going to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. God, I love chocolate. I love brownies. I like my chalky milk. Or it's, God, I like buying shoes. Or it's, God, I love my Roblox. <laughs> God, I love my Fortnite. God, I love my Eminem. God, I love my Snoop Dogg. Come on. Come on. And here's this quote. I didn't give it to you, RJ. I'm sorry. Um, but here's what it says. And if it be painful to bleed, it is worse to wither. Better be pruned to grow than cut up to burn. And if it be painful to bleed, it is worse to wither. Better be pruned to grow than cut up to burn. I'm going to say it one more time. And if it be painful to bleed, it is worse to wither. Better be pruned to grow than cut up to burn. Now listen, some of these things that God asks us to give up sometimes isn't seem like the biggest thing in the world, but obviously if the Lord is speaking to us and calling us to a place to draw closer to him, and if he is the ultimate prize and the ultimate end goal of the Christian walk, why wouldn't we be willing to give up everything for him, no matter how small or menial it may seem to us? But God, I love my sleep. I love my sleep. And God said, hey, you know what? I want you to get up 30 minutes earlier so that you can spend some time with me. God, I love my sleep, God. <laughs> Or God saying, hey, I want you to start praying in your school before you walk in or before it starts. Hey, I want you to start getting with a few people to pray over your school. Hey, I want you to start a Bible study. Hey, I want you to join Jesus Club. Hey, and listen, we don't get to that point unless you're just abiding. And if Jesus is stressing abiding, listen, abiding we see Jesus stress on abiding and not producing because produce or the fruit is a byproduct of abiding. You won't ever have to struggle to try and be kind or have fine peace. Listen, because it says that the branch in itself, I think it's verse, uh, John 15, verse 4. I mean, it's... Yeah, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Have you ever seen a cut-off apple branch bear fruit? It can't because it's not connected to the source. The branch in itself cannot bear fruit. It's, the branch only bears fruit because it's connected. Uh, 
What does abiding in Jesus look like? It looks like reading, studying, praying. And Jesus says in the first, he's that I am the true vine. And he talks about abiding in him. What does abiding in him look like? Reading, studying, praying. And our focus is not on works for Jesus, but works because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done in my life, I want to serve him. Because, and listen, I got to this point point where I'm talking to you right now because I just said, Jesus, I love you so much. Jesus, I love you so much. And all of a sudden he says, hey, I want you to, you know, how about, how about you? You should volunteer. Jesus, I love you so much. How about you volunteer? Okay, Lord. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. But Jesus, first, I just love you so much. True happiness comes from abiding in him. So here's what you need to do. Quit trying to be happy apart from him and abide. Quit trying to stop sinning apart from him and abide. Quit trying to walk out your salvation apart from him and abide. There is no magic formula. It's simple and to the point. Psalms 1 verse 2 says to meditate So, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Everyone say meditate. Say meditate. Meditate. The Hebrew word for meditate is haga. Haga. Say it with me. Haga. Haga. Okay. Anyway, which means to muse and muse. Who knows what muse means? Oh, it says right there. <laughs> It's all good. Muse means haga to muse. muse. Man, you did these notes so good, RJ. To study in silence, think closely, to be absent in mind, consumed by the subject. Daydreaming. How many of you talk to someone and all of a sudden you just start looking at them and they're like, Ooh, and you're like, hello, is there anybody home? And, you're like, and they're like, oh man, I was just thinking about the Amazon and the giant pythons in the water. <laughs> I was just talking to you about, if you want to go to the dog park, man, I wasn't talking about, I don't know, we'll get some ice cream. I was talking about pythons in the Amazon. But here's what the word means. So is that meditate. And so you look into it further. It says to be so, at, to be, and to muse, to study in silence. Yes, yeah, in closing, we're consumed by the subject. Um, to be apt to be so occupied in study and contemplation as not to observe passing scenes or things present. And the way that it describes it is that how many of you have seen people walk and they're just, I'll give an example, they're walking and they're just like, oh. you just see them kind of like mutter under their breath, like, what are they doing? Have any of you looked at your friend and they're doing that? How many of you have seen people do that? Like walk, raise your show of hands. How many of you seen people? Okay, they look like they're insane. But this is what it means is to meditate, to muse. Oh, Psalm 20. Lord, my shepherd, I shall not want him. You're consumed by the subject. And you see them talking, and they're like, and they're like hey, are you there? And they're like, whoa. They're just, but here's the thing, is to be so consumed by those thoughts to meditate, to muse, to mutter under your breath, to be consumed by the thought. And when it says to meditate, we need to be meditating on God's word. So it's like, I'm the vine, he's the vine dresser. What does that mean? And he's like, okay, he loves me if I'm connected to him. And then throughout your day. I know Pastor G talks about a lot about how he speaks in Tongues and how he just, he'll just be speaking in tongues and not even paying attention. But he's so consumed with what the Lord wants and he loves the Lord that it just seems like, in a sense, he's kind of crazy. Like, <laughs> so bring it back to this is that you're the channel for the fruit to grow. 
Okay, you want to look like you want to look like Jesus, abide in him.